in the narrative epilogue in Job 42, 7, God tells Eliphaz, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as your servant Job has. That's the NRSV version of that. What have Job's friends said? We know they have falsely accused Job of a variety of sins. See especially Eliphaz's unhinged speech in 22, 4 through 9. But if translators are correct, to translate Hebrew L as about or of in 42.7, and this is debatable, then what God is angry about isn't what they have said about Job, but about me, about God himself. So what did they say? Much of what Job's friends say about God is perfectly compatible, not only with Proverbs, but the entire Old Testament, especially in the earlier speeches. For example, Eliphaz says in 4.17, can mortals be righteous before God? Can human beings be pure before their maker? Well, the implied answer is clearly not, and this sentiment is, on its surface, unobjectionable from a biblical and theological perspective. Throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible consistently affirms that if there is a disagreement between God and humans, God is the one who is in the right. God is righteous, and humans are not. However, the problem is what Eliphaz really means, the illocutionary force of what he says, and what he is trying to do with his speech, the perlocutionary force of what, of what he's saying. The, the implication of Eliphaz's theologically correct statement that mortals cannot be righteous before God is to tell Job that he cannot be righteous in any dispute with God. In demanding an answer from God, Job is, in a sense, taking on the role of a plaintiff in a lawsuit. What Eliphaz is trying to do by saying what he does, that is what the, the perlocutionary force of Eliphaz's statement here, in 417 is to get Job to be silent and not demand an answer from God. Eliphaz is essentially saying, Job, shut up. How dare you question God? Well, the same holds true when Bildad says in 8, 11 through 13, can papyrus grow where there is no marsh? Can reeds flourish where there is no water? While yet in flower and not cut down, they wither before any other plant. Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. Now, Again, there is nothing biblically or theologically offensive about this out of context. God is our source, Bildad says. If we forget him, we will perish. The problem is the way Bildad puts this technically correct idea to use. He says, essentially, because you are perishing, Job, which is something we can observe, because you are perishing, Job, you must have forgotten God. He's taken a theological statement that starts with God and ends with observable reality. In other words, if God is our source, then those who forget him will perish. That is, we can agree with that. If God is our source, then those who forget him will perish. He's taken that statement and he's turned it around backwards to make observable, re observable reality determinative of God's mind and actions. In other words, he's saying, if you are perishing, you must have forgotten God. He's taken, he's taken, um, yeah, he's taken it backwards. It's logically backwards now. A careful look at these statements will reveal that they are not logically equivalent. It is an example of a logical fallacy known as affirming the consequent. And again, the context shows that the reason Bildad says this is, to, this is to warn Job against arguing his case against God. So even though Job's friends say things that are technically correct and that are consistent with the larger wisdom tradition, at least on the surface, the context in which they are saying these things and what they are trying to accomplish in saying them makes them ultimately incorrect despite their technical correctness. And they are incorrect in what they say about God. What are they saying about God? By implication, that God is offended by Job's angry and bitter invitation to dialogue. They're saying that God has no interest in dialogue with, me, with a mere mortal such as Job. On the other hand, what has Job said that his friends have not? Well, Job has uttered some angry and bitter things about God. Job has, does say many faith-filled things, yes, but he also declares that God is angry at him for no reason, that he is unfairly scrutinizing a fallible human being, perhaps even that God is acting to intimidate him uh, in 13, 20 through 28. Job's speech is full of angry bewilderment, yet God considers Job to have spoken what is correct or honest, uh, which was another way perhaps to translate Nikona in 42.7 about him. So what is correct or honest? I would argue that a big part of the reason why what Job has said about God is considered more correct or more honest than what his friends have said about God is that Job has said these things in dialogue with God. 
and not just when he addresses God as you. Job is calling on God throughout the, the whole book to answer him, to tell him what he has done, what it is that he has done wrong. This interpretation may be strengthened by revisiting the Hebrew word El in 42.7, which is typically translated about or of. Um, so the, the part where it says, you have not spoken of me or about me, what is correct, that about or of is the Hebrew word El. But far more commonly, it means to, especially when designating the addressee of speech. So it's possible that God is angry at Job's friends for not saying what is honest to him the way Job has. In either case, Job's willingness to work out his confusion in dialogue with God contrasts with Job's friend's desire to shut down that dialogue through misused theological language. The book of Job does not end with a nice, neat theological statement resolving the tension with mathematical precision. That would, in fact, defeat the whole point. Job never learns why he has suffered because God never tells him. God's answer to Job is essentially that there is no way Job could understand things from God's perspective. And the implication is that Job had not, in fact, earned his sufferings by committing sins, as his friends have slanderously said. Job was innocent, and God is righteous. Both are true, and the resolution belongs to the mysterious realm of God's sovereignty, not the carefully defined realm of Job's friends' retribution theology. Job may never find out the full reason for his sufferings, but even from a limited human perspective, his sufferings have not been pointless. His sufferings, and the encounter with God that has happened because of those sufferings, has changed Job. Job himself expresses this in 42.5 when he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. This man, who even before all his sufferings was perfect and upright, has grown in his knowledge of God and in his faith, meaning his ability to trust God, despite the appearance of his circumstances.